Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Empowered, brought to you by Cancer Warrior Canada Foundation. If you don't know me somehow yet, my name is Rebecca Durant Hine, and I'm a cancer thriver, an actor, a model, a teacher, and now your host for this evening. Um, as always, I would like to encourage you to participate in tonight's uh, show by commenting down below or uh, posting any questions that you might have. If we if we do happen to get some <clears throat> some questions in during the show, um, we'll save them um, to the end for a few minutes at the end. Um, <clears throat> and oh, and don't forget to use hashtag empowered in your comments and your questions. I am so excited to introduce our empowered guest tonight. Rick Shapiro. Rick is a former practicing attorney who is now a leading consultant, educator, and researcher in the field of safe, evidence-based, integrative, and alternative cancer treatments. He continually seeks to educate the public about proven medical remedies that save lives. He is a member of numerous cancer associations and an active board member of the Annie Appleseed Project, a nonprofit organization that educates people about personalized, integrative, and innovative science-based cancer therapies. And of course, Rick is the author of the Amazon bestseller, Hope Never Dies, an amazing and inspiring collection of stories about how 20 late stage cancer and, and terminal cancer patients beat the odds and survived. Welcome, Rick, and thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you. It's great to be with you. Happy to be here. Thank you. Um, so let's jump on in. So you've compiled in your book, Hope Never Dies, um, which is an excellent book, by the way. I highly recommend it. Um, an astounding collection of survivor stories is in there. Can you tell viewers a little bit about, um, I guess, your background and how you came to decide to interview survivors and write your book? Well, sure. By, by background, um, I do not have a formal medical background. I'm not a medical doctor. I don't have a PhD in biochemistry. Uh, I used to practice law many years ago in a, a small hamlet called New York City. You might have heard of it. <laughs> and uh, actually practiced a little tiny town. In the, Just a little in the one. Part yeah. of the U.S. <laughs> and actually, uh, then I moved to Arizona and practiced briefly in Phoenix. And I'm also a financial advisor part time currently. But back in 1996, my dad was afflicted with cancer. And actually, he had had two prior episodes of cancer. Yeah. He actually had breast cancer and prostate cancer wow. years before. But he was afflicted with an aggressive lymphoma in 96. And at that time, all I knew about cancer was that you're supposed to go with strict standard of care. That was the only way. That was my perception. And obviously, generally, that means chemo, radiation, and surgery. Mm -hmm. So he went to the hospital just a few miles from where I'm sitting here in Scottsdale, Arizona. And the doctor said, this is an aggressive cancer, and we need to bring out the big guns. Mm -hmm. And the big guns meant an aggressive chemotherapy right. protocol. Yeah. So that was actually on January 15th of 1996. And on February, after one cycle, the results of what I saw, the so-called side effects, which were pretty direct effects, not side yeah. effects, were devastating. And uh, I don't even tell people what I witnessed because it was mm -hmm. not horrific. It, it was really bad. So on February 15th, my dad said to me um, and my mom, he said, no more. Uh, yeah. No more. I can't do this. And I couldn't argue with him because it was so... Uh, devastating. He was gone March 29th. He passed wow. away uh, just six weeks after he tried to uh, go the, uh, maybe eight weeks after he tried to go the chemo route. Mm -hmm. So that made me start thinking and wondering, is there a better way alternatively or integratively right. with standard of care to deal with this, this terrible disease called cancer? So time went on, time went on, and I started reading some books about it, doing some research. And then, lo and behold, in 2001, an event occurred that hit me directly. I decided I wanted to increase my life insurance. And, of course, what happens then is the, the nurse comes to your office, takes some blood, asks questions, takes your, uh, does an EKG, et cetera. And, and they came back two weeks later and said, we'll give you more life insurance, but we're not going to give you the premier best rates. And I said, why not? Yeah. They said, because you've got high liver enzymes. I didn't know what that meant. So I sent the blood work to my doctor. I said, is this something or is this nothing? Mm -hmm. said, Let's take a look. Come in, we'll do some more blood work <clears throat> and we will uh, do an ultrasound. He said, you seem to have some evidence of a fatty liver. He said, do you drink alcohol? I said, if I have two beers in a week, that's a lot. If I go to a wedding every three or four years, I might have two gin and tonics, maybe. Right. <laughs> I'm not a drinker, yeah. never was. So he said, okay, but my liver enzyme numbers were starting to skyrocket. Mm. Then he wanted to do a CAT scan. He did a CAT scan, and he said, everything looks, everything looks fine, except you have some evidence of a fatty liver. He asked me again, 
do you drink a lot? I said, no, two beers a week, maybe, and a couple of gin and tonics every few years. That's yeah. it. He said, okay. He said, there is something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disorder. <clears throat> then he said, he, went, he sent me to a specialist. The specialist said, I'm going to take a lot of blood and check out <clears throat> a lot of different things that you might have. So he took eight vials of blood out of me. After that, I looked like Casper the Ghost, as white as my shirt. <laughs> and uh, he came back and said, we don't see anything remarkable at all, but I'm concerned about the numbers. And at this point mm. in time, my right side, uh, right below the rib cage where your liver is, right. started to cause a lot of discomfort at least 12 times per day. It felt like somebody was squeezing a vice Oof. regarding my liver. And yeah. it wasn't acutely painful, but it was significant discomfort. Mm -hmm. That really caused me concern. And he said words that scared me. He said, I want to do a biopsy on your liver. And I said, ouch, those mm -hmm. were scary words. Yeah. So I went back across the hall to my internist. I said, what do you think? He said, if you're asking me if you have liver cancer, I don't think you do, but you might want to get this biopsy. Mm -hmm. I said, I'll tell you what, I will make a deal with you. And I said, let's wait 30 days. If I can start to bring my numbers down towards normal, we will put off this biopsy. He said, okay. So in that 30 days, I was on red alert and I read a book by an Australian doctor and a European doctor who talked about things that were foreign to me, such as mm. ma making major nutritional transformational changes in my diet. And at that time, Rebecca, I enjoyed what I call the standard American diet. And the acronym of that is SAD. It's a sad diet. <laughs> I was eating lots of processed food. I like my cheeseburgers with bacon. I like my French fries yeah. piled high, my milkshakes yeah. and, and, and all the junk food. You, I, I love my chocolate. So, I, you know, vegetables occasionally, yeah. but, you know, yeah, okay, I'll have a little broccoli, you know, once in a while. Yeah. But I was not, people thought in those days, if you had a cheeseburger and you had a piece of lettuce and tomato on it, that counts. You, you, that, <laughs> yeah. how great was that? Right. <laughs> so, uh, then I, 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 I made, so then what I did, I didn't want this biopsy, which I was mm -hmm. told was not very, a not very comfortable procedure because uh -huh. you're wide awake when they're putting this needle into your liver and pulling out tissue samples. I made massive nutritional changes within those 30 days immediately. Uh -huh. I was, they knew me on a first name basis at Whole Foods. I was taking <laughs> veggie drinks about 24 to 32 ounces per day of spinach, parsley, kale, sometimes carrots and beets, which also right. uh, is great because it mitigates inflammation right. and uh, things of that nature. And I was almost all plant-based. I was not a pure vegetarian or a vegan, but I was almost all plant-based. Mm -hmm. No more cheeseburgers, no more red meat, um, no more confectionery junk, yeah. gym, no more ice cream. So no more soda pop. You know, I like my Coca-Cola or my yeah. soda. None. No more two beers a week. Forget mm -hmm. it. I can live just fine without it. Without it. So after 30 days, I went in for my blood work <clears throat> and uh, my numbers started to come down. Went back 30 days later, 30 days later, 30 days later. In six months, I took my numbers from the astronomical, through the roof, dangerous numbers to normal, just by making nutritional changes and taking a few supplements that purportedly help your liver. <clears throat> they said, hey, no need for a biopsy. Now, if I stayed on that path of this lousy standard American diet, mm -hmm. who knows what would have transpired. That's right. um, but I'm glad I didn't, obviously. Absolutely. So those two events, the fact that my dad went through these this very harsh therapy uh, and my personal experience made mm -hmm. me think that perhaps we can alter the disease process, alter the cancer process by making certain other changes in one's lifestyle or bringing other tools to the table inclusive of or beyond standard of care. So then I went to my first cancer conference in the year 2010. So I was really curious. I'm, I'm one of those people, Rebecca, that when I, I question something, I take it to a deep yeah. level of science and I do deep research. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I question uh, general consensus because sometimes yeah. we follow general consensus, which can be done er erroneously or improperly for 20 or 50 years. Very true. There's a new way. Yeah. So. I decided to do a lot of research, went to this cancer conference, and this particular conference, um, I went with open-minded skepticism. I wasn't <laughs> sure if everything was real, That's good, but yeah. I wanted to go and be an interested listener. Yes. And there were doctors and scientists and a lot of uh, people there who were seeking to keep their cancer in remission or to stop its progression. Right. And quite frankly, about 75% of the attendees were women, and most of them were dealing with cancer issues. 
and uh, it's an annual conference. So I went to the conference. I'll just say after four days at the conference, I got back on the airplane from West Palm Beach, Florida, flying back to Phoenix, and I said, wow, there really is something to this. And I talked to a lot of docs and a lot of PhDs and scientists and a lot of people who were there who would go annually to the conference and talk about the fact that they were told 10 years ago they had six months to live mm -hmm. and they were here 10 years later. Yeah. This really got my head spinning uh, <laughs> to think there were positive. Yeah. Well, those incidents got me to start thinking that maybe we need to rethink how we deal with this insidious disease called cancer. And uh, it went on from there. Since then, I've been to 30 conferences and I've wow. spoken publicly at conferences. And I decided the world needed to know yes. about what I've learned. And that's what that's what brought about the book. It's become a passion for me, as, as you can tell. Yes, that's wonderful. Yeah, I very much um, uh, I, I feel the, the same way. Yeah, I. I uh, did the same thing. I took, yeah, a really deep dive when I was first diagnosed because that's my, that's just my instinct. And I have the research skills and ability to do that. And um, yeah, and then just ran with it. And, and then, yeah, that, that ended up leading to Arenda and all of this too, is that there's a, there's a need. I 100% agree that there people have the uh, right to know that this information is out there and it shouldn't be as difficult as it is to find all of that information. So yeah, I Very couldn't true. agree with you more. Mm -hmm. And actually the information is there if you know where to if look. To look, yeah. You have to know where to go, but That's right. the lay person, people who are not in this industry sector who don't mm -hmm. know where to look, just assume that, well, if my doctor says I've got to start chemotherapy on Tuesday and I can still eat whatever I want yeah. and just don't worry about it, then they they go down that path that's out of right. fear that's right and yes fear is a huge factor yeah yeah I, I was there i've been there i totally understand that too for sure so many of of your survivors in talking about fear uh, many of the survivors in your book um were told that you know there's nothing else that could be done that if they, that they would die soon if they didn't receive chemo and radiation and all of the the standard of care um or that they would die anyways even yeah. with these treatments so um so many ca cancer patients hear this as a, you know a death sentence and it decimates their hope and in uh from speaking with um the survivors and just in your experience in general in this this world of integrative cancer care um how does that loss of hope do you feel how does that loss of hope affect a patient's outcomes and why could it be potentially dangerous to hear that that uh prediction great question great question the concept of hope, H-O-P-E, the concept of hope is critical. Mm -hmm. Think about it. If somebody has a glioblastoma, which is a very, very aggressive brain cancer, mm -hmm. pancreatic cancer, which lots of people think you've got three to six months, maybe six to nine months, lung cancer, uh, aggressive ovarian cancer, uh, triple negative, whatever the case may be, people think, oh, my gosh, and the mortality flashes before their eyes. Oh, yeah. But the concept of hope is critical. And knowing that others have walked in your shoes before you and are here 5, 10, 25 plus years later, despite the fact they were given a dire prognosis of a short expiration date, a short time to live, it's paramount. And, and I'm here to tell you unequivocally, factually, that regardless of the cancer, brain, prostate, breast, lung, colon, ovarian, melanoma, uh, kidney, you name it. Yeah. And I've met these people and they're in the book. Uh, they are here. Many are here 10, 25 years later, despite the fact they were told they had a short term lifespan. So right. hope is vital. If you don't have hope, it's hard to have a platform from which to move forward. So true. Um, but people can survive and thrive. And it, it inspires people to, to get up out of that bed and that that prone position, that fetal position where they've got the, the pillow over their head, thinking, oh my gosh, I've got six months to live because that's what the doctor said. Well, the doctor does not know it all. The doctor does not realize that there are lots of situations where people have thrived many years later. And when a doctor says to somebody, you've got six to nine months to live, and this was told me by an integrative oncologist who I think is a brilliant guy. In fact, he wrote a chapter in the book. His name is Dwight McKee. He said their perspective of stage four cancer as being incurable, because that's what really it's incurable and it's traveled to another part of the body, is pursuant to conventional standard of care medicine. Yes. It's not pursuant to bringing other immune supporting, life supporting 
therapies to the table, yeah. which they are not aware of, or they just do not utilize in the overall approach. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, hope is paramount. And, and I just want your, your audience to know that there is hope. And I know lots of people, I've met at least 500 people conservatively at 30 conferences who are told by your major cancer centers in this country that you've got only X time frame. There's nothing more we can do. Get your yeah. fear ignored. Yes. It, it's not necessarily true. Not necessarily true. And I didn't find your book until, until after, until last year. So I was already through the worst of all of it, but um, I did have other books that I read of, uh, you know, just personally written by the patients themselves, just about their stories and what they did. And right. um, it was so helpful to me, even if it was a different type of cancer or a different situation. And in some cases that even helped me more because it was like, okay, look at this person who had a, you know, a very aggressive stage three or stage four cancer and they did it. And I'm not in as, as rough a situation as that. So that means I can do it too. You know, it's just, it's, it's like you said, it's that foundation on which you can then move forward into your physical healing because it's impossible to heal uh, on any level, if you're, if you're just in a, in a depression or filled with anxiety and stress and all of the rest, it's just, it's an uphill battle. And, and, and another, one other point regarding that is when doctors make predictions and say, you've got six to nine months to live based on our statistics, mm -hmm. based on mass statistics, right. you are not a statistic. You are an individual. Mm -hmm. What you do after you, after look, some people get this kind of prognosis, they bury their head under the pillow. And they right. just kind of go into a deep depression yeah. and don't become proactive in any way. But as an individual, you can take action with the appropriate practitioners and yes. implementing the appropriate therapies, whereby <clears throat> not pursuant strictly to standard of care medicine, you can be one of the so-called remarkable survivors or outliers. But guess what? If we brought a lot of these therapies to the table, I think the outcomes and the statistics will be far, far improved. Yes. So, so survival predictions that people make can, as I think you stated, become self-fulfilling prophecies. Yes. And we just become depressed and we lose hope. And when you lose hope, in, in terms of trying to accomplish any kind of daunting task, it's harder. Yeah, you want to climb that right. local mountain? Oh, I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. It's too hard. Yeah. I don't know. What are your chances of actually making it to the top That's of the true. mountain? Yeah. Excellent comparison. Very true. Um, so... Uh, on that note of, um, you know, burying your head in the sand versus taking action, um, a lot of the stories that you have in your book from survivors, they they talk about being active patients. And so can you comment on being an active patient versus a, a passive patient? And how is that advantageous for the people that you uh, interviewed? It, it makes a very big difference. And <clears throat> it's interesting across the board prevalent with all the people I interviewed and people I've met, hundreds of them over mm -hmm. the course of time, the ones who do the best are proactive. They become advocates for themselves. They don't become just a, for lack of a better term, sheep or lemming and just yeah. follow exactly what the doctor says, start chemo on Tuesday and live your life, eat what you want, don't worry about it. Right. Well, there's lots of things you can bring to the table. So becoming an active participant is important. Becoming a cancer scholar, if you will, is important. And learning about things that you can utilize creating a team of people, a trusted team of people who you, who you respect, who are sophisticated mm -hmm. in dealing with cancer is critical. Whether it's an integrative oncologist or an integrative doctor who has a multifaceted approach, or it could be an open-minded oncologist yes. who, who knows somebody who's a nutritional oncology expert, or somebody who's an expert in oncology supplementation, or other particular therapies we bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Creating you know, social support for yourself is, is critical. So becoming an advocate and taking the bull by the horns, not just sitting there passively and waiting yes. is important. There's always things we can do. And even if hypothetically someone is in remission, my perspective is don't go back to old habits. Mm -mm. <laughs> your body, transform everything from your biochemistry to your mental and emotional attitude so this ugly disease does not come back and haunt us again. We don't want recurrences. So no. we need to make changes in who we are physiologically, emotionally, and mentally. So Absolutely. becoming active, proactive is really important and will optimize survival and thriving. 
Yes, 100%. I always say that cancer is a team sport and you have to like really build a team that you trust and that you like. And then you have to become a member of that team too. It's so important to be a member of your own healing team um, because it's, and, and more than even just your physical healing, like you said, mentally and emotionally too, there's a lot of helplessness that comes along with cancer at the beginning, you know, why this is happening to you and you're being told, you know, do this on Tuesday, do this, do this, do this. Um, and so becoming active, it helps you take back some of that control too. So even um, aside from the obvious physical benefits it's going to have, for me personally, it, it really helped to support my mental and my emotional health as well in, you know, taking back some of that control. Exactly. Sure. And becoming engaged. I mean, it engaged. reminds me of a story. Um, told me by someone named Jean Wallace, who's a nutritional oncology expert, mm -hmm. I think one of the best in North America. And her mother had cancer. And her mother said, okay, I got cancer, but I'm not a cancer person. I'm just having to be a person who has cancer. And after 12 noon every day, I'm not talking about cancer, thinking about cancer. I don't have cancer after 12 noon. I, I have too many that. things to do. I got to go for my hike every day. Yep. I got to get into my garden every day. I've got errands to do and life to lead. And, I'm, and cancer out the window <laughs> after 12 noon. Period. Full stop. End of story. <laughs> but the point is that taking control of your situation versus letting cancer put you into this depressive state of, oh, my gosh, the world is ending. Yes. It, it doesn't have to be that way. But, but finding that inner resolve is not easy. It's not. It's not easy. And it can take a little time to get past that first those first words that you hear, if, mm -hmm. you know, you have cancer. Mm -hmm. When we, we see our mortality flash before our eyes, an, oh my gosh, moment that everyone has who's been told those words. But finding that inner fight is really important, that inner resolve. Yes. And it may take a few days. It may take a couple of weeks before we get out of bed or before we get up and say, okay. We're doing it. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing it. I'm going to, we're going to, I'm going to be fine and I'm going to be here, you know, decades later and everything will be, everything will be good. I'll get back to my life. Yes. And change my life mm -hmm. in a good way. In a good way. That's yeah. awesome. I love that. I love that story. That's so great. I'm going to keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, I'm, <laughs> day. I'm done with you. Done. I, do. I got more life to live. I got more things to do. Yeah. Exactly. So we probably already touched on this a bit, but um, on the on the the flip side of um, of having your hope decimated, um, how does keeping or finding that hope positively impact um, survivors and then even like their physical health too? Because we know there's a mind body connection. Yeah, and, and yeah, we, we touched on a little bit. We can expand on that mm -hmm. certainly, but I mean, and I think it's really important to know that when you are told you have cancer, uh, you can't just keep the fight, keep the fight up, have that no quit attitude mm -hmm. and, and be careful about your peers and your family members who are well-meaning and they care about you when they try and give you instructions all the time about what to do and when to do it. Yeah. And, and I know a doctor here, and I know a doctor there, they all mean well, but you need to also shut the door sometimes and say, okay, I'd rather, I don't want to talk about cancer now. Yeah. I'll bring it up if I want to talk about it. I'm fine because you can imagine everyone with their emails and their phone calls. How are you? How are you? How are you? Mm -hmm. it, it wears on you and it's it tiring and it's exhausting. And becoming exhausted does not help our immune systems. No. You know, we need to keep an immune, strong immune system up. And uh, That's right. that, that, is, that is absolutely critical. So um, I, I can just tell people that, you know, that inner resolve we just talked about is important and keep on moving forward in a positive way. Surround yourself with positive people, yes. not the naysayers, not the negative people, not the people who say, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. Believe it, it's okay. Yeah. If you think of, in this world, the statistics say that about 40% of the people will get cancer or have a diagnosis sometime in their life. I think it's 50% of men approximately and about so. one third of women. Yeah. So it's not so shocking that Someone's going to get it. That's right. It's not like one out of a hundred. <laughs> and you know what? We, we can live with it and live long, long lives. And, and, and we just have to make some adjustments sometimes. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Very good point. Um, yeah. It's uh, that just that idea of keeping the open mind and making the adjustments and I think also your point about um, surrounding yourself with positive people too. It, it's, and it's, 
sometimes difficult when you're taking an integrative route because people around you might disagree with you or they might because they're scared too um and what they're used to is the standard of care as well i know i ran into it a lot at the beginning as well from various um people but uh just being having that inner resolve like you said knowing that you can that you can do it and 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 sticking to that just listening to what you know your inner voice or inner wisdom is telling you and just staying true to that and as much as possible trying to find yourself uh, surround yourself with people who align with that with those same feelings right and you made an interesting point right there with respect to the fact that a lot of people will say you know why are you going off on this integrative route why don't you just stay with the conventional Mm -hmm. well you know if you go back 20 years ago the word integrative basically meant quack to a lot of people so Mm -hmm. integrative if you don't do standard of care i mean that's ridiculous yeah a lot of institutions now, cancer centers do have a, a small integrative department. Now, I personally don't think a lot of their integrative uh, perspectives on therapies are a sophisticated methodology, a multifaceted, sophisticated way to attack cancer. It's not comprehensive and it's not personalized. That's right. But we are making some progress. <clears throat> but one of the reasons why some of these therapies and treatments are not utilized, and, and maybe we should touch on this just really briefly, mm-hmm. is because <clears throat> it doesn't pass muster with the approval of the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Why is that? Because it takes approximately, and these are approximations, 10 plus years to get a drug. And we live in a pharmaceutical society approved by the FDA. First, they have to do what's called looking at cancer cell lines under the microscope. Then they do tests on animals. Usually it's mice. Then, Then they do a phase one study, which could be 30 to 60 people. Then it could be a phase two study, which could be you know, 50 to 150 people. Phase three could be 300 to 500 people. It takes 10 plus years to do that. And according to Tufts University Medical School up in the Boston area, study of drug approval, study of 2014, $2.5 billion to do a study. Now, even if their numbers are off, because those those are their words, you can Google it yourself. Even if it's only just a billion dollars, I mean, that's an insane amount of money. Now, how can someone afford to do a study for a billion dollars? Well, here's the easy answer. Think again about what you see on TV these days. How many drug commercials do you see every day on TV? It's a big profit motive business, right? So they make billions of dollars when they get a patent, okay? With that patent for 20 years, they're protected, and then they can procure billions of dollars. If you have hypothetically some of these other treatments and therapies, let's take the word curcumin, for example. Mm-hmm. Curcumin is a biologically active agent in something called turmeric or turmeric, depending on how you pronounce it. Mm-hmm. Now you can get turmeric in your spice cabinet. Right. Uh, you might put some turmeric on. I might put some turmeric on the salmon I'm going to make tonight. Mm-hmm. And uh, but no one's did a done a study that the FDA will approve on curcumin. Right. Why? Because it's a natural agent, and anybody can sell curcumin. You can't patent that, Mm-mm. but it might be highly effective in supporting the immune system. Therefore, some of these other things, and that's just one example out of many, will never be approved and never recommended because, again, you need to get an ROI, return on investment, that billion dollars, the return on investment is the patent. The patent brings about billions of dollars. Think again about the TV commercials. So that's why some of these things will never be recommended by conventional medicine, unfortunately. And it's a a damn shame. It is. It really is. Mm -hmm. Um, It's terrible because these are things that can be brought to the table to help extend lives, save lives, and enhance quality of life. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. And that is um, exactly it. I mean, there are lots of um, studies on, you know, these lots of different integrative and and natural approaches to cancer, but they're not the, you know, gold standard of double blind Mm -hmm. placebo, you know, all of that, like that's just, yeah, never going to happen because it's just too expensive. And yeah, you can't make money off of vitamin C and turmeric. (laughs) It, it, it's true. Vitamin C, turmeric, vitamin D3, yeah. green pea extra. We can go on and on. All on the different and on. Things. Yeah, that's right. It, it's true, and it's, it's terribly unfortunate. It is. It is. Um, so, well, in that that vein of these things that are that are that are out there, even if even if we don't have the um, the studies that would back it up. Um, while interviewing some of the survivors, uh, what were some of those more effective ways that you came across that they had used to heal their cancer or in the process of healing their cancer. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to name a few. Mm-hmm. Uh, generally speaking, nutritional oncology, nutritional changes is paramount and critical. 
think about the basic concept. What is what do we all do every day on, on this planet? We all generally eat some food every day, right? <laughs> yeah. So the quantity and quality of the food is highly relevant to our health. Mm. It really is. We were not made to eat donuts. Mm -mm. But, you know, a lot of people, we, people go to Dunkin' Donuts every single day. Nothing against Dunkin' Donuts, but I don't think it's the best approach if you want to, if you care about your health long term. Right. So nutritional oncology is tremendous, tremendously impactful, one bite at a time. Selecting food with intention. The phytonutrients in food is, is, is critically important. So generally speaking, it's a good idea to stay away from refined foods, processed foods, things you find in the grocery store in a can yeah. or a plastic bag, uh, foods with excess sugar or sugar equivalents, foods with artificial ingredients, uh, foods that are tainted with pesticides, herbicides, and insecticides, GMO foods oh, yeah. are not a good idea, soft drinks, alcohol, simple carbohydrates. And I'll define simple carbohydrates, basically white rice, pasta, potatoes, bread, which are simply bad. Right. Um, dairy products are not the best. Um, fast food, all kinds of confection, confectionery junk yeah. are just not good. And by the way, I'm not a vegan or a vegetarian. Yeah, me either. It's really a good idea to stay away from that. And if you can't alter your intake, the food you intake, just for general health. And that yes. goes for cancer, heart disease, diabetes, all sorts, any malady. Mm -hmm. But the food we eat is extremely important. And again, the old acronym, Standard American Diet, SAD, it is sad. In the animal world, it's a good idea, you know, good idea to stay away from factory raised food, stuff that's raised in an institutional manner. The factory protein that's infused with chemicals, hormones, antibiotics, and other man-made food designed to make the chickens grow fatter, um, designed to have them lay more eggs and have the uh, cows deliver more milk by 25%, uh, the fish that are farm-raised. Farm uh, all of that stuff is not a good idea. I mean, think about it. The chemicals they're shot full of eventually ends up in our stomach. That's right. And it's just not a good way to go. Um, so if you can go with, you know, pasture raised food, wild fish, <clears throat> things of that nature that are not infused with all of these chemicals that were only introduced really in the last 50 years, they didn't exist right. years ago. And <clears throat> anyway, we're part of the food chain. We don't want to eat that yeah. kind of crap on the good side. Things we want to eat, obviously are organic foods if possible. Now, organic foods can sometimes be a little bit more expensive, but if you shop carefully, <clears throat> maybe you can find some good deals here or there. But whole foods, not just the junk that we often eat. Leafy greens, spinach, kale, arugula, berries, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, uh, organic vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, carrots, tomatoes, and other vegetables are really quite healthy. Um, and uh, when it comes to fruit, fruit more in moderate quantities because mm -hmm. you've got sugar and fruit, sugar. natural fruit. Yeah. So it's okay, but I would not substitute fruit for vegetables. Yes. Uh, if you make yourself a veggie drink, um, don't make yourself – there's a lot of fast food places that have these, these fruit drinks. Right. You pulverize the fruit. You're just drinking an abundance of sugar. Sugar. That's what it is. Stay away from that. Sugar is not your friend. Sugar is the friend of, of cancer, and cancer is the glutton for sugar. So, you know, eating healthy types of protein and try to keep your animal protein down to the size of an appetizer, not making it the big main course, that right. big two bone steak yeah. with mashed potatoes piled high. Mm -hmm. No. If you want to have red meat, fine, make it pasture raised if possible, and then have more veggies in your plate. Uh, and less of the starchy stuff we just talked about, yeah. the white bread and rice and the potatoes, not the best idea. But vegetables, vegetables, vegetables are really important. So nutritional oncology is number one. Um, yes. I moving agree. on from that, evidence-based supplementation. Evidence-based is the key word. Now, supplementation, there are supplements out there that are not going to help you. Um, they're a waste of money, uh, some of them. And people often distribute them and recommend them not knowing what they even do. But there are excellent supplements out there that I think should be utilized in everyone's diet, whether you have a disease issue or not, just for maintenance of your body, to plug in those nutrients that we don't get from our foods, mm -hmm. uh, and to mitigate inflammation and to enhance our immune system. And if you have a cancer situation, to certainly 
mitigate inflammation because inflammation drives cancer and cancer drives inflammation. That's right. And there are ways to do that. There are ways to check that with blood work. Your C-reactive protein numbers will indicate your, your CRP numbers CRP, yeah. will indicate your inflammation. There are supplements that can mitigate that as well as that. And uh, there are supplements that can also enhance your immune system and even cytotoxically. The word cytotoxic means going after cancer cells, killing toxic okay. cells, cyto cells. So there are things we can ingest on a daily basis that are profoundly beneficial in the supplement world. Those are those are things. And if you put, if you, hypothetically, you put the words into pubmed.gov, P-U-B-M-E-D.gov, pubmed.gov, which Love is the <laughs> online library for the National Institute of Health, you put the word in curcumin cancer. So many. It's, urgent, it's free. You'll come up with over 4,000 studies. Oh, yeah. I've done it. So <laughs> there weren't 4,000 studies just for the fun of it. Obviously, there's something there. There's something there. You put the word green tea cancer. If you put in the oh, word, yeah. um, you know, vitamin C cancer, you'll find mm -hmm. tons of studies that, that drive us to the perspective that it's helpful. So supplementation, nutritional, and, and then I'll go to exercise real quick. Sure. Exercise is really, really important. So important. It's important for everything. Yeah. But exercise brings oxygen-rich blood to your tissues. <clears throat> Cancer loves an anaerobic environment. They don't like, it doesn't like an aerobic environment with positive, rich, rich, oxygen. fresh oxygen. Exercise brings that to our bodies. Exercise reduces fatigue. It reduces stress. It reduces anxiety. It's just a good, positive thing. Uh, it helps us sleep better. It reduces nausea if we have nausea. And regardless of your physical condition, even if you're hypothetically in a wheelchair, get a couple of those cans of Campbell's soup. Don't drink them. Don't eat them. <laughs> Use them. <laughs> And, and get your body going. So utilize exercise. It's an important thing. So nutrition, appropriate supplements, and exercise. But it's really good to have experts guide you yes. specifically to what to ingest in those areas. And yep. they can make those determinations through objective criteria. What does the word objective criteria mean? Blood work, tissue samples, to know that, okay, you should really – have this particular supplement in this particular dosage because your blood work is is X Y Z your A one C numbers your C R P numbers your yeah. uh, your blood viscosity uh, so there there's a science to it to be strategic yes. not just getting something off the shelf at your grocery store that's right yeah because I mean there are some uh, you know general supplements that that everyone could benefit from but especially sure. when you're in a cancer situation where every person's body is unique and the reasons why they developed cancer are unique. You really have to dig. And I think this is one of the things that really separates conventional from integrative is the personalized approach. Because in the conventional world, everybody gets the same. You know, if you have breast cancer, this type of breast cancer, you get this, these chemo drugs and, and you get radiation for this amount of time. And then you get, you know, so there's, it's set for everybody. Whereas with uh, integrative or alternative, and particularly the supplements is that, yeah, you have the ability there to, um, if you're working with someone who knows what they're doing, pick the ones that that are really going to support you and help you in the best way possible, you in your unique situation and why you were developing cancer in the first place. Right, right. And there are, there are naturopaths who specialize in yeah. oncology. Yeah. There are some open-minded doctors, uh, functional medicine doctors who specialize in oncology. There are even complementary practitioners who just get involved with supplements in the oncology yeah. world or nutrition and seek out those people. Uh, they don't have to be exactly in your neighborhood. You can work with them over, online or right. through the phone, but make sure you're dealing with experts who have great expertise in your area. I know what they're doing. Exactly. All right. So moving off the, the physical a bit, I'm going to get back to um, sort of the mental and emotional aspects of, of, the interviews and in in your book. Um, a lot of survivors in your book talked about um, this positive transformation that ca cancer initiated in them. Can you talk a bit about that and, and what are some of the ways that they achieved that transformation? Sure, sure. Well, knowing that they had hope brought about transformations and transformations they went through, it was very interesting. Um, some people said, you know what? I don't worry about the small stuff anymore. It's the big stuff that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, like that, that book that used to be called, Don't Worry. It's all, almost all small stuff. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't worry about the small stuff. Uh, I can think of several people who said to me, several, that I used to be closed minded, I used to be more anxious, I used to be much more critical and judgmental as a person. I'm not that way anymore. Mm 
I, I, I pray for I'm not judgmental anymore. I'm not critical. Um, I try and find the commonalities and the beauty in everybody. And I found that cancer has transformed people in that regard. Yeah. Uh, I found a lot of people have become much more, as I said earlier, a cancer scholar and, and, and do their own homework and research and uh, have become much better as a result. And then also gratitude. I find a lot of people have focused much more on gratitude Huge. and appreciating the stuff they have in their life that they never, they always took for granted. And, and, you know, they're alive now and they can have a future and they just took life for granted and time mm -hmm. for granted. So gratitude is a big one and how fortunate they are to be able to, to use a cliche to smell the flowers. Yeah. And people don't complain anymore. So, you know, it, it, it transforms people uh, towards becoming much more positive having a good outlook on life mm -hmm. uh, on a daily basis, enjoying the moments That's and right. not, not complaining and judging others harshly. That's right. Because we don't walk in their shoes. That's right. We don't. Other people's shoes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So th those things were, were significant, significant changes that uh, people experienced. Yeah. Uh, for me, uh, gratitude was huge. I mean, it was the first, I think it was the first, shift that I noticed, the first positive shift that I noticed in myself was um, gratitude. It was, uh, I think it was a tree or something like that. I was out for a walk and there's a really nice tree and I was like, oh my God, it's so beautiful. And it was just that stereotypical, you know, movie moment of the person who's, you know, had the near death, death experience. And, you know, they have, like you said, it's cliche or cheesy, but you know, the flowers are beautiful. The sky is beautiful. The trees are beautiful. And then that just led to more and more and more. It just opened the door, I guess. Once the door was open, then it just all sorts of positive, yeah, changes and perspectives and things started coming through. So, yeah, you know, if you can find that one one thing to, to, to start that process, even if it's a little thing um, that you're grateful for. Yeah, I love that. Absolutely. Um, so also, I... Uh, in your your book as well there is this repeated connection um between the mind and body in healing and i'm sure a lot of it has to do with that idea of um holding hope and 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 staying positive um what are some of the mind body approaches to healing that the survivors that you've talked to have implemented sure and and there, there are several and mm -hmm. everyone's different uh but regarding mind body stress impacts the immune system and stress is one of those things we want to mitigate so we have a strong Absolutely. immune system to be able to surveil, yeah. find the cancer and, and detect it and go after it. Um, people need to learn how to relax and not let cancer control our attitude or behavior and let, let it promote stress and foster anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, but different methodologies, I'll, I'll name four or five. Yeah, absolutely. Meditation is one. Yes. Um, and people say, well, gee, I don't know how to meditate. And, and, and should I have some mantra? Should I just go like, oh, you know? <laughs> and, and But there's lots of ways to meditate, learn to meditate, and and quiet the body and quiet the soul and, and become one with yourself and to learn to be calmer and relaxed and not all, let all the extraneous stuff that affects our brain every day of the week, yes. all of us, myself included, certainly, yeah. um, all the nonsense. We want to try and find some time to get that extraneous stuff yeah. out. Oh. So learning to meditate can be helpful. Uh, music. Uh, music, I find, can be just a great relaxing thing. I mean, sometimes I'll sit at my desk and working on some financial stuff. And if I don't need to have totally 100% focus, I'll put on some nice music. You know, and it makes the things go by, especially okay. tedious tasks. But music yeah. in general, you know, can be just calming and, and quiet us down. And so we're not, you know, clenched up with our shoulders all yeah. the, half the time. So music is another thing. Prayer. <clears throat> and, and prayer can be very helpful to, to a lot of people um, in, in many capacities, in many ways, mm -hmm. and uh, make us feel better about yeah. things and, and things going forward, certainly. Uh, humor. Mm -hmm. Laughter yeah. can be great. And some people, there are people out there who specialize in humor, believe it or not. Yeah. And in the cancer world, yes, there's a few out there like that. And you know, maybe you find yourself going to a website. The first thing you do every morning, subscribe to a humor or a laughter website and find a joke that. of the day to start your day off. Something that makes puts a smile on your yeah. face, it makes you laugh. But I love humor that. It can be a nice thing to reduce stress. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, stress reduction classes exist out That's there. Right. 
whether it's online or in person, more online these days mm-hmm. due to the, the virus. Yes. Um, <clears throat> but it's important to mitigate fear. Yeah. And fear is another acronym, F-E-A-R, forgetting every available resource. Oh. F-E-A-R. I when love we have that. fear, we're so nervous and stressed out, we're yeah. forgetting the fact there are resources, forgetting yes. the available resources. Um, it's true. It makes everything just kind of fly out of your head. <laughs> yeah, forgetting everything and running. Yeah, you know, and running. Kind of thing. So th- those are some things that people utilize to reduce stress. And, and, and when we can reduce stress and calm down, we have more impact over our mind and our body. And, and if we're calmer, our body cooperates a lot more than a high stress kind of uh, perspective on life and on right. cancer. Yes. Absolutely. Wonderful. Those are excellent tips. Thank you. Um, and okay, so uh, is there a, just, I know there's so many uh, fantastic stories in your book, but is there a particularly astounding one or impactful uh, story of survivorship that you could share with us? Well, yeah, there's 20 fantastic. Impactful yeah, I know. <laughs> so They're all great. <laughs> um, but all right, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one about somebody. Uh, I'm happy to name her because I named the actual sure. people in the books. I don't use any John Doe. Or, yeah. I mean, real people. So there's a woman named uh, Janet Summer. And Janet is, uh, she lives in Ohio. She was a lifelong nurse and a nurse educator. Uh, she was a tennis player. She was an active athlete. Uh, and, and at a certain point in time, uh, and I'm just giving you the real abbreviated version of her story. Mm-hmm. But she had a chronic nagging cough, and she couldn't get rid of this nagging cough. It just persisted, and and there's nothing she could do. So back in 1995, um, well, she had this cough. She went. She was playing tennis one day with a doctor, a friend of hers, and it wasn't her doctor, but she said, "Hey, can you you know do a scan of my lungs just to make sure nothing's wrong?" He said, "Okay, I'll do that." So they did a scan, and then they found whoa serious lung cancer diagnosed in 1995 that's 25 years ago yeah and uh they had found that it had metastasized to her pancreas stomach and liver lung cancer she went to one particular hospital and that hospital said that she had about three to six months to live she went to get a second opinion the second opinion told her i'm sorry you've got three to six weeks to live three to six weeks she was told by a major medical cancer center. She told her son she was gonna die. She felt that that was it. And she was brought up, brought up in the conventional world. Right. She had surgery to remove the stomach mass and one dose of chemo. She was told that you know the chemo might extend her life maybe a couple of months from the three to six months, uh, or three to six weeks, excuse weeks. me. She went, she was a slightly built woman. She was uh, about 114 pounds. And in three weeks, she went down to 72 pounds. She lost, that's well over 30 pounds. It was a tremendous, imagine going from 114 to 72 pounds in three weeks, a precipitous and dangerous loss of weight and vitality. Janet, she said, quote unquote, I look like a concentration camp survivor. And she went into hospice care and assumed it was just gonna be a short time frame. <clears throat> but her conventional doctor, who was kind of open-minded, said, you know, why don't you try an alternative treatment? And Janet said, well, I, I can't do that. She literally said, I can't do that, that's for hippies. Those were her words. She said, alternative stuff is nonsense. And again, she was brought up in a conventional world. Right, right. So reluctantly, at, her sister twisted her arm and said, let's contact a macrobiotic nutritional counselor. So they did in Cleveland, and she was very fortunate to find this counselor who put her on a particular strict macrobiotic diet. And Janet was very important, very lucky. She had great social support. She had eight close friends who brought her, who made her and brought her every day because she was in no shape to make no food. to make her own meals. But they cooked her a strict macrobiotic diet and, and food every day. Um, And she was in hospice for over a year and literally over a year. And she made slow progress. uh, But eventually, after a year, she changed her biochemistry 
And at a certain point, she said to her doctor, I don't want any more scans because I don't want any more bad news. But she was getting better and better, slowly and slowly and gaining weight. And she was off now her standard American diet, obviously. Right. Yeah. She made it all the way back. Now, what happened was interesting. Her doctor was so astounded by her, this person who went from 114 yeah. to 22 pounds with <laughs> dangerous metastatic lung cancer. So let's go in front of a tumor board. On the tumor board in a hospital is a, a group of people. It can be doctors and social workers and nurses uh, who you, you tell them what happened. So they did have oncologists, nurses, social workers, et cetera. There was about a dozen of them in the room. And she told her remarkable story. One oncologist in the room said, how do we know that you're the same person that <laughs> had these fantastic results? Well, Janet's doctor, he, he didn't believe it. <laughs> who comes back from that kind of metastatic right. separation based on nutritional changes. And she didn't even go the conventional route. No. Well, quite honestly, in the book, most probably uh, 15 out of 20 took an integrative approach. She took an alternative approach. So Janet's doctor said that if you look at the x-rays, because years before, Janet had fractured one of her ribs. And there was a mark on the x-ray that showed the fracture. Right. And then they had done a scan. And um, it was the exact same person, you know, yes, said in the summer, see, kind of summer. Yeah. And with the exact same place uh, on the ribs and said that if you see the mark on a rib cage, it's the same exact person mm -hmm. from the broken rib. And that this is Janet. And this is what she did. So the doctor who was a naysayer, the critic said, well, it must have just been the one cycle of chemo that cured her. <laughs> and, and, and another oncologist piped in and said, that's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Um, I don't believe that because when a patient has this type of lung cancer with metastatic disease, the chemo never works, even when a patient completes six a cycles. Round. Wow. So I said to myself, if it never works, you do six cycles, why are you doing it? Yeah. That's what the doctor said. So there she was. Uh, that's one out of 20 remarkable stories. And, and Janet wow. also said, um, I, I will tell you, she said that you need to give me just a about three mm -hmm. seconds and I'll, I'll see if I can find it here. But she said, oh yes, she's the one who said also, I used to be cynical and angry. Now I'm more open and trusting. I thank God my doctor was open-minded and encouraged me to explore macrobiotics. She said, nutrition makes a huge difference in your life. And then she said, quote, we eat like pigs in America. I thank God every morning for the new day before my feet hit the ground. And she closed the interview by saying, never give up, never give up, never give up. So that's one remarkable result uh, that happened to Janet Summer of Ohio. That is, and it's, I think it's particularly incredible because she wasn't someone who was open to that sort of an approach right. from the beginning. And I think, I think you know, sometimes when we are like, for me, I've you know, I've grown up around you know, natural and alternative medicine. So it, it wasn't a big leap for me. It was just my automatic. I knew pretty much right from the beginning that I was going to be asking questions and, and maybe not doing everything that they wanted me to do. Um, but for someone who didn't come from that background, who came from the opposite, I think that's why it's so particularly astounding is because, um, yeah, she wasn't, she didn't already have that, that desire to do that, but, uh, right. but it's just really, it's really incredible evidence for uh, what you said before in terms of nutritional oncology and it being one of the most important aspects of it. Yeah, it's so inspiring. It, it, is, it is inspiring and it, it, it's illuminating. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that there are other things you can do, whether it's exercise, nutrition, uh, supplementation, mind, body, and, and other things, it's empowering to know it that is. there are other things we can do. And, and if somebody gets into a nervous situation where they're anxious, one of the most important things to do when they first hear the words you have cancer is to breathe. Deep Take breaths. Breath. Don't forget to breathe, really, because mm -hmm. people can become panic stricken. Oh, and, so easily. It, it sometimes takes 15 to 20 years. This cancer might have started 15 to 20 years right. ago, or at least eight to 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. We don't have to jump into chemotherapy right on Tuesday. That's right. You can get different opinions. Yes. Yeah, that's right. You have time for opinions. You have time for uh, also just searching within yourself, too, for yeah. what's the right answer for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And it comes back to that fear. You know, yeah, if you can take a breath and you can dispel the fear, then you'll remember that there are lots of other resources that you have. Yeah. Available. Absolutely. Wonderful. Um, now, quickly before we go, we're, we're pretty much out of time, but um, I just wanted to uh, ask you to 
to, yeah, because I know you're a board member on the Amy Appleseed Project, and it's probably not um, something that a lot of people are familiar with, or maybe at least here in Canada. Would you just talk briefly about what that project is and, and, and what your aims are? And then even if people want to get involved or want to learn more, where, what, what can they do? Uh, uh, sure, absolutely. Happy to. Uh, the Amy Appleseed Project, yes, I'm a board member of that group. Um, they have an annual conference in West Palm Beach, Florida. And I've been to 30 conferences. I've been to lots of conferences throughout the nation, literally from LA to Florida, uh, et cetera. And uh, I think it's the best conference out there. I think it's, I, I encourage anybody uh, to attend. The purpose of the conference is to really inform people of wonderful integrative and alternative treatments and therapies. The key word here is evidence-based, yes. not nonsense, yeah. not, you know, tweak your left eardrum at two yeah. and the cure of cancer, but real <laughs> evidence-based, therapies and treatments. And there are doctors and scientists and uh, lots of practitioners and people dealing with cancer who speak at the conference. And 50% of the benefit of the conference is not just attending for three days and hearing this wonderful mind opening information, empowering information, mm -hmm. but intermingling with other people. Yeah. It, and, and the food that's served is all organic and you're sitting next to somebody um, from Quebec, from from Calgary, from Toronto, from wherever, Ottawa, and and who's dealing with cancer. And you have this, you know, some people say, I don't want to be around people with cancer. But when you're around people who have walked in your shoes or are walking in your shoes, yeah. the information you learn, everyone is so empathetic and loving and considerate. Yes. It's an amazing conference. I, I've gone 10 out of the last 11 years, wow. and I'll continue to go. So it's... Uh, it's just a fantastic conference, and I encourage anyone who wants to grow and, and educate themselves regarding treatments, treatments and therapies that can keep this thing in remission or stop the progression. Uh, I think it's worthy of your considering going to. Wonderful. That's great. Thank you for sharing. And I, I imagine it also inspires a lot of hope to be around Tremendous all of hope. those people. Tremendous yeah. hope. They get some fantastic speakers. I mean, the hope that when you come out of that conference, if you go in there, a little bit down, you'll come out inspired. Uplifted. You'll be on cloud nine in That's a good wonderful. way. Wonderful. It, it, it's fantastic. Awesome. Well, Rick, I just want to thank you so much for being here tonight and for spending your time with us and sharing what you've learned. Um, it was it was really, really wonderful and informational and, and inspiring. And I'm sure everybody who is watching and will watch the recording found it to be to be that way as well. Um, if anyone would like to find out uh, more about Rick's book, Hope Never Dies, you can find that on Amazon. Is that correct, Rick? Yes, you can get it on Amazon or you can okay. go through the website, hopeneverdies.com. Great. It's up there. Yes, if anyone, the URL is up there on the bottom of the screen, if anyone would like to go check it out. Um, and if anybody would like to know more about uh, me and Arenda Cancer Community, you can find uh, my blog at arendablog.ca and you can find Arenda Cancer Community on Facebook. Uh, just search Arenda Cancer Community FB group and you will find me there. Um, and of course, Empowered is brought to you by Cancer Warrior Canada Foundation, um, which is an organization that works to do many things in the community and when it comes to cancer, raising awareness, raising funds for research. Um, and right now they are also helping um, anybody who needs it with things like groceries and meals and uh, hand sanitizer and all of that stuff. So if you or anybody else you know needs some help, uh, you can find Cancer Warrior Canada on their various social media pages, um, or you can call the phone number that's scrolling across at the bottom of the screen. I um, just want to thank Rick once again for joining us and everybody who has tuned in to watch live or who will watch the recording later. Um, we hope that you thoroughly enjoyed tonight's episode and thank you for being with us. And Rick, thank you once again for being here. My, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.